Welcome back to another session. I, I hope you are well. Um, I would like to, in today's session, um, see if I can take you from where we ended last uh, to where I'd like to start to build this conversation of philosophy. Let me start with the end in mind. Let's start with the end. Philosophy. What is your philosophy? That's a good question. I think it would, it would serve anybody a lot of benefit if you sat down and you, you picked up a piece of paper and you answer the question, what is my philosophy? Now, it's not an exam. You don't have to get it completely correct. But what it does is it starts to help you ask questions. I think one of the best things we should do as humans is to, 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 to develop this ability of asking questions relentlessly. Start with the bad ones, get better at asking questions and move towards the good ones. But by asking questions, you start to get clarity. Clarity is an important word, something we don't use a lot these days. So if you're suffering from depression, there's a sense, and this is my personal perspective. I believe that there is an, a lack of clarity. There's something perhaps you're not aware of. There's something you don't know. There's something you can't see. There's something you're not focusing on, but there's something unclear, generally speaking. It doesn't matter what specific said thing might be, but you have to accept that you are unclear about something. And clarity often is the first step. Um, on the road to Damascus, someone who was perhaps lauded and had a, a zeal, a passion, a purpose, fell off his horse. That's just the, the right word, fell off his beast. And the scales fell off his eyes. He was blind for a short while, or his vision was restricted, that's a better word, not necessarily blind. His vision was, vision was impaired. And he was able to see, not through his sights, but through his mind, he could, he could see with insight as to who he really was. And he realized um, that the one thing he hated the most was just staring at him right in the face, assuming he stood in front of the mirror. The point of, was he came into realizing that his zeal was directed against the wrong thing and that that which he hated very much was something that he was. And he went through a process of change. He had clarity. The pictures became more clear and that clarity made him understand uh, that most of the time, our concept of what this life is, is a theory. It's not reality. Mine include, included, it's a theory. We, we, we start off with a hypothesis of what we think the world is and what we think life is. And we put in interventions, we put in measures, and along the way, we're looking back and trying to calibrate and see whether we were right. And the more success we have in being right, the more we believe or we accept that our version of reality is the correct one. We are always wrong. There is a, an element of surprise uh, because we don't know how everything ends. But we can always look back for inspiration. We can look back at thousands of years and say, well, how did the people before us transcend and journey through this uncertainty? And that's where clarity comes in, that the history books and the lived experience of other, other people provide some clarity. Philosophy is one of the clarity methodologies that allows life to be less of suffering and more uh, of an adventure and rewarding. And the reason for that is because there is really, at this present time, very, very little original philosophies. Most philosophies are synthesized and they are, they are amalgamations of different ideas and words and inspirations. And the reason is simply because some people have done it so well. And we just copy, copy them and we replicate them and we apply them and then we modify. Life is a craft. Life is not an art, it's not a science. Uh, science means that things replicate themselves based on a pattern and therefore there is some absoluteness, cause effect. You do X, you get Y, but we know life doesn't work that way. Your neighbor doesn't work and makes a fortune. The neighbor next to you on the other side works his whole life and actually cannot afford to feed his family. So 
It's not hard work alone because both parties may be working hard and some even less so. Life is also not an art because it would mean that some people are skilled and they have the gifts and it's innate and therefore you can't learn. Life is a craft, very much like cooking. There are ingredients that we see and there are recipes that we are given. Um, as we take the recipe and we mix and we try to make this great meal, um, we make mistakes. But the more we do it, we get better. And the more we get better, we get more confident. And as we get more confident, we start to, you might say, personalize the meal to our taste. So you might say, well, do you know, I don't really like that herb or that spice. Ooh, I'll have me some of those. Ooh, that's nice. And I'll have me some of those. And you're making it your own. That is the craft. That is life. And what we try to do with a lot of these concepts here is to share ingredients. Like a buffet, you don't have to eat everything. You, you try this and then you try that. But what you shouldn't do, and I covered this in two sessions prior, adaptability should not be a lifestyle. You shouldn't be adapting every single day by changing philosophies every day. Otherwise, you lose sense of who you are. And this is why in most of you, in, in the midst of all of your suffering, to sit still and let the still small voice within you speak. It's always speaking, but we drown out the voice with noise. But if you sit still and just listen or ask questions, you see, someone once said that all of human suffering stems from man or woman's inability to sit in a room quietly and do nothing. Because we, we cannot sit in silence. And it's in the silence that the voice within you, that guide, that spirit, that knows all and can guide you, um, speaks to you. Um, there is a part of us that guesses. I admit that for myself. Um, every day is a guess. We decided what do we do next? I'm guessing. I don't have the answers. I hope my answers will help will be correct, but I'm guessing. You can live life by guessing, or you can live life through faith, hope, and love. And what faith, hope, and love does for you is it connects you with, with the one inside you who knows but doesn't guess. So um submission simply becomes an act of faith and love and hope. From the one without who guesses to the one within who knows. And this is where prayer or inspiration or, 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 or meditation comes into the picture is that we're asking for direction, we're asking for help. If you're struggling with depression, sit still and ask for help. Now you don't have to believe in any theology or religion or deity. Speak to the one within as you would someone you love. And just say, I am confused. I don't know what to do. I think I will make mistakes. I would like to avoid mistakes. In a way that I cannot explain, can you guide me? And then trust the prayer, the conversation, or the request. And just sit back and watch what happens. Um, a bridge of incidents will come about where you are led down a pathway that perhaps you couldn't have come to on your own and you find a better solution to the one that you may have selected. You see, what I've explained so far is a philosophy. At the end of the day, it's just a philosophy, which is what philosophy is. A way of setting your sails in life, a belief system. And this brings me to today's session. Your philosophies will create principles, or rather you create principles from the philosophies you hold dear to you. Those principles will inform your belief system. So you start off with an idea and then you assign a weighting in terms of believability or acceptance or acceptance, faith and love to a set of ideas. You have a belief system. Your belief system, system will translate um, depending on how you live your life or lead your life into a set of standards. Uh, virtues that you hold deep near and dear, um, or preferences, values, which form 
your identity, but also inform your character in a manner that what happens is that your words, your deeds and your actions are one. That gives you integrity. Now, this is where we bring in depression into the picture. If you're depressed, it's indicative that there's a lack of integrity in the picture. It's also indicative that perhaps on your value system, there's been something that has been moved away from its original position. It could also indicate that your beliefs have been found wanting. They've been tested and found wanting. If you have, and do not subscribe to the whole thing about depression, it also means you subscribe to a philosophy. That philosophy is giving you principles. Those principles have instilled a belief system in you. That belief system is informing your values and your virtues, and therefore your character reflects what you say and what you do and what you promise. You have integrity. You tend to find that people struggle with this whole concept of integrity. Integrity just simply means one. In the, in the words of the great writers, um, the first commandment was here, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one. Um, one. Integrity just means one. Consistency and oneness. So that what you say, what you do, how you lead your life is one. If you're depressed, but you pretend not to be depressed, or you put a brave face to other people um, to, to cover up and hide who you really are or what you're struggling with on the inside, it means your actions are not consistent with your words. It means you lack integrity. So one of the ways of starting to heal from this depression thing is to simply say, well, I have a choice. I either become completely in integral with my lived experiences, my philosophy, my principles, my beliefs, etc., my values, or I accept this lack of congruency in how I live my life and lead my life and what I say to people and what I put across uh, to the public. And in order to move away from this state of being incongruent, I'm going to let go of this picture, this philosophy that doesn't empower me or doesn't help me. You can be a person of character and have the wrong morals. And I, again, I have so far, as I started today's session, I haven't yet talked about morality. Because you see, if you were to play it properly, you would say philosophy. A sub would be principles, but philosophy and belief and then morality. Morality sits there in between because morality deals with what's right and what's wrong. Um, let me throw in another word, degeneracy. Something that I've, I've said and I've used previously. Degeneracy simply means without morals or something that is degenerating. You can generate, regenerate, and it means you're giving back, you know, bringing back life or you're replenishing or you can be a degenerate, which means you're, it's, it's, it's a pathway towards destruction and death. Now follow this. Ignorance leads to worry and doubt, which leads to fear, which leads to anxiety, which leads to depression, which leads to uh, your body going to a state of being a, in a, a disease, uh, which leads to death and destruction. That pathway is guaranteed. Why? Because the seed reproduces after its own kind. So for, you, in many ways, you can say with all of that is integrity. Why? It's consistent. It reproduces after its kind. The other side is life. It begins with knowledge begins with study and information, begins with understanding what you've studied and the information you have, translates to wisdom and understanding, leads to faith, faith is expressed, leads to well-being, freedom, you being at peace, life and abundance. Two opposite worlds. And so when we start with this whole concept of morality, we're simply asking a simple question, what is good and what is bad? What is right and what is wrong? I would like to think that depression um, is not something that I would wish upon my worst enemy. And if the answer is true, if that answer is correct, and if you accept that position, then it means it's not something good. And if this is not something good, then I put it in a, in a category of things that I should aspire not to be. And therefore, 
I avoid in my words, I avoid in my feelings, I avoid in my actions and in my lifestyle. If you want to get through the process of understanding and overcoming depression, you have to start with self and ask yourself a simple question. Am I living a life of integrity? What are my philosophies? Are my philosophies uh, available in my principles? Are my principles uh, animating my attitude? Because I can look at your attitude and I can determine what your philosophy is. I can look at your actions and I can determine what your philosophy is. I can also look at how you act, live your life, and I can say this is what and who you are from a perspective of morality, integrity, your values, your principles, and your ethics. Um, I am yet to find people, think about this, um, let me use someone perhaps who many people may be familiar with or may not be familiar with. Um, Robin Williams, back in the day, and this obviously shows how old uh, I am. Um, Robin Williams was loved uh, by everyone. Uh, he, he made people laugh and, you know, he, he, he changed um, modern television to an extent. Uh, just an incredible actor, um, made great movies, uh, put smiles on people's faces. Uh, he walked into a place and people smiled, happy to see him. Why? Because he created that positive experience for people. And then he kills himself. Um, depression, for whatever reason. Um, we've heard of other people. I wouldn't use people in the recent times because that might evoke some emotional reaction. Um, people have taken their lives, uh, partly, primarily also due to depression. Um, just saying, you know, I've suffered enough, I want out. And it's very easy um, to sit back and say, well, they shouldn't have done that. Um, and this is where perhaps as we move into the next sessions, it might get slightly more heavy than I, I am sharing now. Um, and I will apologize in advance because I might choose the wrong words, but I hope that the, the proposition and the expression intent is, is, is observable. It can be very easy to, to say, well, they should not have done that. And one can say that very easily because one does not know their suffering. However, if you, if you accept this whole idea of integrity, your words, your deeds, and your actions are consistent, then it means you, you cannot promise your son just before he walks out uh, of the house to go to school that you cannot say you love him and you will be there for him. Um, you cannot make expressed or implicit statements that tell him that daddy will be there for him. And as soon as he leaves, you take your life. Um, that is out of integrity because effectively that simply suggests that your words were not consistent with your actions. But more importantly, it draws our attention to the whole concept of morality. What is right and what is wrong? Now, if we go back to philosophy and we'll move forward as far as all the various ideas. If you believe in the concept of consequentialism and that the consequences is all that you focus on, or you believe in the whole concept of the do no harm principle or maximum utility. In other words, if you want to reduce your suffering to the maximum limits, you might come to the rational explanation as to how taking your life means you stop suffering because you're out of the picture. I wouldn't say much about it in today's session. I would say this as far as I'm concerned. All of these ideas, utilitarianism, consequentialism, uh, hedonism, uh, the, even libertarianism, all fall under the umbrella of what we call relativism. It's all relative. It's all about your feelings. It's, it's not objectively qualified. I can't argue with your, your, your feelings because it's your feelings. I can't argue with your vibration because it's your vibration. I can't argue with the frequencies you're referring to or emotions. They are yours. They are valid, but they're not necessarily sound because from an objective standard, you can't actually provide any supporting evidence to support that position. So it's all relative. And whenever you have an, a conversation from a, a relative, uh, a relative perspective, you find that one party cannot argue with the other because one party is right and the other party is right. And who can say who is right and who is wrong? And that's where we start to see struggles, especially amongst young people. From the baby boomer generation, did a horrible job. 
disregarded all of the qualities and the virtues of the silent and the great generation because for the first time there was peace and uh, believed that life was supposed to be about fun and disregarded uh, the great inheritances in, in ideas and philosophies and, and principles from their fathers and grandfathers and gave nothing to their offsprings. Instead, raise their offsprings in this whole concept of solipsism about the individual. But it's all your feelings uh, matter. Your feelings are the most important thing. And we see young people and something happens and the first question a parent would ask a child is, how do you feel? And how did that make you feel? Oh, baby, how are you feeling? Everything's about feeling. So that we've come to pedestalize and deify feelings above everything else. It's all about us. The world revolves around us. And therefore, we see the world through this lens that says, if I feel bad, or if I'm not feeling perfect or optimal, something is wrong. Without realizing, no, hang on. Your parents failed you. They didn't equip you with the right emotional muscles. They did not equip you with uh, the developmental phases. They didn't even teach you how to rough and tumble play, take risks. Um, they didn't allow you to evolve. And many of you, many of us, were not raised with a father and a mother, more importantly, a loving father and a loving mother in the same house. So we didn't actually get to see the dynamics of how life was supposed to be lived. So we were never set boundaries, or even if we were set boundaries, the boundaries were not enforced as they should. We never got in, into role playing, rough housing, taking risks, going out there and learning how to express our emotions, but not get everything we want. And after 30, 40 years, sometimes 15, 16 years, we're just big babies, despite being adults. And we complain about everything because it hasn't gone our way without realizing the world doesn't owe you or me understanding. The world doesn't care. The world simply says, take the cards you've been dealt and play your best hand. And so some people come to a point of a crossroad and they say, I want out. The suffering is too much, I want out. Now, the point of all of that rant is to simply say, if you understand and if you've delineated good or bad, right or wrong, you have an understanding of your morality, what's moral. If you believe killing someone is moral, then I have nothing else to say to you. It's hard to change a person's mind. As a matter of fact, I have to change your identity first, especially because most of people have the identity they wedded to their ideas. So I can't change your ideas, except I change your identity, which is why in sessions prior, I made reference to the subconscious mind and your identity, that you have to change it. It's called self-confidence, self-esteem, self-worth, self-concept, self-belief, self-discipline, because it comes from self. I can't change that. I can show you a pathway, show you a different idea, but you have to change yourself. You know, in any case, if your moral position is that it's fine to kill someone or it's perfectly justifiable to kill self because maybe I can't kill someone because that would infringe on the person's rights. But I own myself, which is part of the issue people struggle with in the West with regards to depression, is there's a sense that they own themselves. So I can do with myself as I please without realizing that there is an arrogance in that statement. You didn't make yourself, you didn't create yourself, you didn't birth yourself, but you say, I own myself. I am my own property. And as part of my property, I can do with my property as I please. That is a moral position. That is a philosophical position. On the other hand, if you believe that my body is a temple and I should take care of my temple, but one of the things I cannot do is burn it down, then I can't kill myself. Now, by starting with that position, you have non-negotiating standards. You're simply saying, I will not take myself out. We start with that. That's a good start. So, irrespective of the feelings you have and the thoughts and the experiences you might go through, you've said, I have non-compromising standards, one of which I will not kill myself and I will not kill another. Fine. Then you have a line that you never cross. We can work backwards. The next step is to simply say, well, can you love yourself? Can you give grace to yourself? And can you actually develop and train yourself to get the muscles, emotional, mental, psychological, um, that is required for this journey and adventure we call life? I am stunned, especially in the West, as to how many people 
young and old, are not emotionally resilient, psychologically resilient, mentally resilient, even physically resilient, spiritually absent. And it is no wonder that we suffer and that we struggle. Why? We haven't been trained. In the medical sciences, if you don't use a muscle, it atrophies, it dies. If I hold this arm and I, I put a sling and I keep it there for the next 20 years, the day I remove that sling, this muscle will atrophy. Why? What you don't use, you lose. And for most of us, we haven't been developed, we haven't been trained. Back in the day, um, without giving out too much, until you've been punched in the face, the fear of being punched was always greater. I remember when I started training, uh, the fear of being taken to the ground was greater than the actual experience. A threat perceived can be more powerful than a threat performed. And I remember teaching younger ones, which is, don't be afraid of a punch. You are going to get punched. Just commit to your punch and your technique and whatever happens between when you set off and when you get to the target, it's out of your hands. And even if you get whacked along the way, it's part of the process. Now, usually it sends a ring through your brain. It's almost like a vibration, boom. The pain is intense. You get punched the first time, you get punched again, you get punched again, and suddenly what you find is that there's nothing to fear but fear itself. Will it hurt? Yes, but you do it anyway. You feel the fear and you do it anyway. Why? Because you've come to a point of recognizing that it's part of, it's part of the environment. This is martial arts. This is combat sports. You're going to be taken down to the ground. You're going to be submitted. You're going to be punched. You're going to be kicked. So you accept. And then you start to develop skill sets and learnings that allow you to mitigate the damage that can be done. Speed, precision, timing, protection, uh, control, avoidance. And then suddenly you have tools. So you come against someone who you've never met. And this is what life is. You come against an experience you've never seen. You're not confident that you will overcome, but you're confident that you won't throw in the towels. You're confident in your ability to withstand, go through, go around, go over, go under the obstacle. And that is what most people struggle with, is that we're so, we're still infants, you know. And I'll end today's session by simply saying, you know, how long are you going to keep sucking on mother's breasts? At some point, mummy has to put her breast away and you have to get up and get off the milk and start to eat normal food, get those jaws trained. And that is where uh, depression wins over most people, is that we're not resilient, we're not trained. Um, we, you can't medicate this. It's part of life. And I tend to find that this is a, a fascinating observation. You take people in the West who are suffering, or who, who say they are suffering, and you transport them to a poorer country, Africa, India, somewhere in South, Amer South America, uh, somewhere in Asia, and they actually see real suffering. And they see people who are suffering, who have a smile on their face, who have hope, who have faith, who have love, and who believe. And suddenly it alters their mind completely because they realize that for the first time, they are seeing people who are not focused inwardly, it's not solipsism, it's not about me, my feelings, what I've not been given, what I haven't actually achieved. And they see people who are just living, just embracing life, living out what, uh, the life from the, out, from the inside out, and just embracing what the world has to offer, as opposed to looking always within. And so one of the recommendations as I end today's session as far as this, your philosophy will drive the principles you live life by. They will drive your morality, good, bad, or indifferent which will drive your values and your ethics and therefore form your character. That character determines your lifestyle and you will have integrity in all of that or it will be void of integrity. In any case, you can choose a story. and One of those stories will be, listen, the world doesn't owe you understanding. The world doesn't care. The world doesn't want to hear about your problems. The world just simply says, we take you as you are. You want to compete? come onto the floor like a gladiator and start swinging. But recognize, once you're in the arena, all is fair in love and war. 
it will get bloody, which is what life is. It will sometimes will get bloody, but you have to learn how to swing. And unfortunately for most people, and this is perhaps a rude thing to say, the arena is the wrong place to start training how to fight. You do training outside in preparation for coming inside. And uh, emotional resilience and, 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 and psychological resilience and, and mental resilience and, 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 and even physical temperament and, and resilience is key. But above all of this, the awareness of the spirit, the awareness of your greatness, and the awareness that, listen, um, what is in you is greater than what is without. It's necessary. Otherwise, you will find that you will fall to the next idea that is false, that is not your birthright. Um, it may not be called depression. It might be called something new. But you will fall for anything because you don't believe or you're not founded on something. Now, I hope today's session has been useful.